We'd like to begin by acknowledging our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva and Keech Nation peoples and their neighbors from north to south, the Chumash, Tataviam, Kitanamuk, Serrano, Kawia, Peom Kawicham, Ahashaman, Ifai Tipai, Kumyai, and the Kachan peoples, whose ancestors ruled the region that we now call Southern California for at least 9,000 years. Indigenous stewardship and rightful claims to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished nor legally extinguished. We pay respects to the members and elders of these communities, past and present, who remain caretakers and advocates of the lands, river systems, and waters and islands of the Santa Barbara Channel. For a more detailed land acknowledgement authored by the USC Van Hunnick History Department, we invite you to visit their website. For those of you joining us on Zoom, we'd love to know where you're watching from, so feel free to let us know in the chat. And if you want to know what indigenous territory you're on, my colleague Maya will be posting a link for you to investigate that. So my name is Martha Stroud. I'm the Associate Director of the USC Dorn Scythe Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And on behalf of the center and the USC Shoah Foundation, I'm delighted to welcome you to this lecture, those of you in person, those of you on Zoom, and especially our honored guests, Lisa Shapiro-Gold, thank you for being here. Just a couple of notes about the protocols for those watching on Zoom. Right now you're viewing a side-by-side -side view where you can see the slides that we're sharing and also the speaker. And I just wanted to bring to your attention that you can make either window larger or smaller by dragging the dividing line in between these two windows. Um, and you may want to do that to focus on the speaker more fully. We will have time for questions and discussion at the conclusion of the lecture. So we certainly invite and encourage everyone's participation in person. And um, for those of you on Zoom, please ask your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. One other note about logistics for those of us in person. For those of you who have RSVP'd to the lunch, the lunch has been moved indoors because of the weather today. So we look forward to celebrating this year's Sarah and Asa Shapiro Scholar together with you inside the University Club following the conclusion of the lecture. So now to kick off today's distinguished lecture, I'm very pleased to turn things over to the Andrew J. and Erna Finchy Viterbi Executive Director Chair of the USC Shoah Foundation, Dr. Robert Williams. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Or do I need to project? Excellent. High school theater training doesn't help with projecting sometimes. So. Uh, welcome to the seventh annual Shapiro Scholar in Residence Lecture. I want to begin by thanking our remarkable partners at the USC Dornsife Center for Advanced Genocide Research, especially Professor Wolf Gruner and Dr. Martha Stroud. These two excellent scholars and colleagues not only contribute to USC's success, but they really do make an indelible contribution to the fields of Holocaust and genocide studies. And together, we are delighted to host this year's Shapiro Scholar in Residence, Professor Jan Grabowski, one of the world's most eminent scholars of the Holocaust. Professor Grabowski's work has been essential to understanding the development of the Holocaust as it occurred in German-occupied Poland, a country, as many of you know, that suffered particularly during the course of the Second World War and the Holocaust. Many of its cities were destroyed during the war, and liberation at the hands of the Soviets only brought different forms of destruction. 
During the Nazi occupation, the Germans erected around 700 ghettos across Poland and a network of concentration and death camps that claimed millions of lives, including the lives of three million Jews during the Holocaust. And to give you a sense of the scale, that's approximately one half of all Holocaust victims. Now throughout the world today, including here in the United States, people are beginning to forget this history. Worse than that, there are groups, there are individuals, and there are interests who are intentionally distorting this history to suit a wide range of rather narrow ideological ends. And Poland is not immune from these tendencies, despite its remarkable history. Over just the last three years, as our mutual colleague Rafal Pankowski has noted in some of his publications, there have been remarkable incidents including extreme right politicians from Confederation who not only engage in outright denial of the Holocaust, but attack well-known Holocaust survivors, including some whose testimonies are housed here at the USC Shoah Foundation. Elsewhere, popular scientific, or sci-fi, not scientific, sci-fi authors, whose names I won't say out loud, openly traffic in anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. Less overtly, statements from some government officials have suggested that the Jewish people are not sufficiently grateful to non-Jewish Poles, while others have suggested that Jews actively collaborated with the Nazis during the German occupation. And across the spectrum, a perhaps understandable desire to focus on story of rescue during the Holocaust is inviting a different sort of problem to emerge. It runs the risk of suggesting that rescue of Jews was the norm it was not, it was an exception. Too exclusive a focus on rescue narratives also minimizes the remarkable heroism of those 7,262 Poles recognized by Yad Vashem for unselfishly saving the lives of Jews during the Holocaust. This is why the work of Professor Grabowski is so necessary. It's why we are honored to have him here with us today. This lecture is thanks to the Sarah and Asa Shapiro Annual Holocaust Testimony Scholar and Lecture Fund, a fund established by longtime USC Shoah Foundation Executive Committee and Board of Counselors member Mickey Shapiro. The fund enables a senior scholar in our field to spend time at USC, to spend time at the USC Dornsife Center for Advanced Genocide Research, and to spend time at the USC Shoah Foundation to not only engage with us and elevate our understanding of these subjects, but to also strengthen the network of scholarship needed to keep these subjects alive, vital, and relevant for future generations. If I can get this page unstuck, there we go. And this gift is only one of many gifts bestowed on us by Mickey Shapiro. Just yesterday, Mr. Shapiro allowed us to launch the Mickey Shapiro Endowed Chair in Holocaust Education Research here at USC. This is a significant achievement for our university because it will allow us to continue to educate in new ways, sorry, innovate in new ways on education of the Holocaust, something most essential today because the old tactics we employed 30 years ago no longer apply. So if you can't tell, we're very grateful to Mickey Shapiro for his continuous commitment to our mission and to our work. And today, we're happy to be joined by Mr. Shapiro's niece, Lisa Shapiro-Gold, who will say a few words about Mickey. And with that, Lisa, the podium's yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for attending the Sarah and Asa Shapiro Annual Holocaust Testimony Scholar Lecture. My name is Lisa Gold. I am a 3G survivor and the granddaughter of Sarah and Asa Shapiro and the niece of Mickey Shapiro, who has made this event possible for nearly a decade. My grandmother never felt like she was able to speak her truth out loud until my brothers and I became of age. This is when she was able to finally face her trauma and share her narrative. In that moment, she recognized how her testimony could help to prevent this hatred from happening. Although she personally has only shared her story with me two times in my life, I have her testimony recorded through the Shoah Foundation and I can continue to learn from it and share with my own children for a lifetime. Right now, as we know, 
anti-Semitism is being weaponized and embraced, and we must educate young people on the psychological and historical components of the Holocaust. As we are now more than 75 years away from the horrors of the Holocaust, many young people don't know what the Holocaust was or understand the dangers and potential consequences of anti-Semitism and what is possible when hatred goes unchecked. As my grandparents always said, we must continue practicing our Judaism. We must never retreat out of fear. I am hopeful that continued scholarship and research in the field will help us better understand our history and what can be done to prevent it from happening again. Scholarship like Dr. Galbrowski's help inform what and how we teach our young children, our young people, and in turn, the decisions that they make and will ultimately shape and inform our world. By pairing research with testimony-based education, we are able to help people create personal connections to history, connections that will foster a deeper knowledge of how we can counter this terrible wave of hatred and inspire actions and words that will lead us to changed behaviors in a more peaceful and tolerant society. Such research and education is needed now more than ever. I look forward to learning from Professor Garbowski on his research in the Holocaust in Poland. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. So now to introduce the 2023 Sarah and Asa Shapiro Scholar in Residence. It's my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the USC Dornsteif Center for Advanced Genocide Research, the Chappelle Guerin Chair in Jewish Studies and Professor of History at USC, Wolf Gruner. Thank you, Marta, and uh, also thank you, Badema, and everybody who worked uh, behind the scenes uh, to kind of enable this lecture uh, today. Um, I uh, also want to give back uh, to, uh, my kind of uh, thanks to Rob uh, Williams. Uh, uh, I think this is a good start for a new chapter in the cooperation between uh, the Center for Advanced Genocide Research and the USC Shaw Foundation. So I want to just mention this. And then uh, another thing obviously goes to uh, Mickey Shapiro and uh, uh, the, the whole family for enabling us, which is not really kind of common everywhere, that uh, to invite luminaries uh, uh, of Holocaust research every year to the campus of USC so that our students can benefit from it, that uh, uh, our kind of outreach can benefit, that people can actually learn about the Holocaust from those who really are doing groundbreaking uh, new research. So I'm really grateful uh, for this. Um, so let me start with introducing uh, this year's luminary. And uh, this is Jan Gorowski, and uh, he is professor of history at the University of Ottawa in Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He has been teaching at Ottawa since 1993 and winning the Professor of the Year Award in 2014. His academic training includes a PhD in history from the University of Montreal and an MA in history from the University of Warsaw. His research focuses on the Holocaust in Poland specifically, but more in particular on the relations between non-Jewish and Jewish Poles. He is one of the most productive scholars uh, we actually had here on campus. I mean, he uh, authored, co-authored, or edited 20 books and published more than 80 articles in many languages, including just German, Hebrew, English, Polish, French. Can't mention any, uh, all of them, right? So this would take uh, another lecture. But I need to talk a little bit about some of them. And one is... Uh, the uh, really important book which uh, Jan uh, published in um, 2011 in <coughs> Polish, and then uh, very quickly after this in 2013 uh, in English, uh, and the English title is Hunt for Jews, Betrayal and Murder in G uh, German Occupied Poland. And this uh, book not only won uh, the Yad Vashem Prize for the um, uh, uh, Prize for Holocaust Studies in 2014, and I can say that I was on the jury there. 
uh, there was no uh, question that this uh, book really deserved it. And I think what is important about his research is that he has this kind of really micro-historical approach doing groundbreaking work on local issues. And uh, this reveals really in a different way the kind of mechanics of persecution, cooperation, collaboration, but also resistance. So that's kind of really an important way uh, to uh, gather new insights. And when we talk about education, I think this is really the base for education, is these kinds of uh, research results. Uh, some other work he's done is also important to mention because he is not only writing his books, but he's also providing stuff for other researchers. And this means, for example, he is editing volumes with documents so that uh, we other researchers can benefit from his groundbreaking research, but also students can use them. So for example, uh, kind of uh, the, uh, the book uh, Jews in Warsaw, which are documents of the uh, Warsaw Jewish Council, which he uh, authored together with uh, Kamirsky. And then uh, he is also, uh, I think, known for not shying away from kind of controversies and this makes an innovative and really groundbreaking scholar. And for example, one of the early things which I had uh, kind of where I kind of uh, encountered this was this small booklet which uh, was published by Yad Vashem in 2008, Rescue for Money. And this is a topic which is really kind of uh, sensitive, uh, but I, uh, so I'm very grateful that he actually uh, tackled this because I talk to my students all the time about this problem, rescue, why are, uh, what do we make out of it that people ask for money? Is this kind of uh, extortion? Or is this necessary to support uh, the, the people so that they can survive? So these are important questions, but as I say, sometimes controversial. He worked also on questions of property. But the most uh, uh, recent book he co-edited and co-authored uh, needs to be mentioned. This is um, Dale Just Notch. I hope I pronounced this right uh, or close. <laughs> uh, in English, it's Night Without End. Uh, and it was already mentioned. And here, uh, uh, the book kind of tackles the persecution and responses in certain counties in uh, Poland. And this book enables us to, in a way, to compare the uh, kind of different factors who go into, who kind of shape what happens on the ground. Uh, and we can only do this if we have this groundbreaking research on in detail on these different, on this county level. So this was a very important book, also very voluminous. Now uh, came out in English in uh, uh, 2022. And uh, the most kind of waited for uh, book uh, for me for me personally is actually the book which is uh, which came out in Polish in 2020 and will be published this year by Yad Vashem in uh, 2023. Uh, so this year, uh, and it, this is uh, about the role of the Polish police. Uh, during the Holocaust. And this is a chapter which is always kind of mentioned, but it was never really kind of uh, researched in detail. And so I'm, since I can't read Polish, I need to wait for this in, uh, in English. So uh, this is already showing you uh, kind of the, the breadth of his work, the groundbreaking nature uh, of his work. And uh, I can't wait for the next ideas, uh, uh, which you hopefully will share with us during his residency here. Um, he received, obviously, a, a numerous awards and fellowships. He was the 2023 uh, Distinguished Visiting Scholar uh, in, at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, and he received the 2020 uh, Canadian uh, Impact Award for Research. And then he was uh, appointed to prestigious positions like uh, the Baron Friedrich Karl von Oppenheim Chair for the Study of Racism, Anti-Semitism, and the Holocaust at Yad Vashem in 2011. He was the in, uh, Ina Levine um, Invitational Scholar at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. in 2016. He was a Distinguished Fellow at the Institute for Zeitgeschichte in Munich. Uh, in Germany, and uh, recently the Clever Winger Professor and Chair at Leiden University uh, at, in the Netherlands. And so these are all very uh, deserved awards. And uh, I uh, hope you can uh, kind of bear with me for a second, because before I hand over to Jan, uh, 
something happened today which I want to share and kind of uh, commemorate. Um, um, and it actually is, um, I think, also fitting because what I will kind of say uh, makes more clear to us why the work of Jan Grabowski and scholars is so important. So today I got an email that a close friend of the center uh, and of mine, uh, a survivor from Poland, from Lodz, uh, who was 90 year, 98 years old, Zivon Neumark, uh, passed away. And uh, I want to share this with you and uh, hope that we can have a short, uh, brief moment of silence. His uh, life, which he shared with uh, tons of students in my classes here, he has an interview at the Shaw Foundation, and uh, he was has a remarkable kind of story because uh, as not so many story, uh, kind of, uh, um, as we don't hear often, he was a really a resistor. So he escaped from several camps, he forged his identity, he saved himself seven, or I think, or even more than seven other Jews uh, during the Holocaust. So he had a remarkable life, and he was uh, all from, uh, sharing this with uh, the students here at USC. At any occasion, he was always kind of uh, coming. And he was also a remarkable man. And I just want to kind of uh, say this and for a brief mo a moment of silence uh, for him. Thank you. So, Jan, sorry that I had to do this, but I think it's really, it shows us really uh, how important the research now is when uh, we really uh, kind of, so many survivors are kind of uh, are going and uh, so. Please welcome Jan. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Wolf, it was like hearing about someone else, I must say. It was very nice of you, and I appreciate. Um, I appreciate very much this invitation. It's uh, an honor. I'm humble, humbled, and I would like to express my gratitude to all of you, to, um, to Wolf, to Martha, uh, to Robert, uh, uh, to all colleagues from, uh, from the University of Southern California. Uh, to Mr. Shapiro and his niece, um, uh, to all of you who are here, including survivors whom I met, uh, I'm very grateful uh, for your uh, presence. And I must tell you that being here is a bit of a magical experience because uh, um, Shoah Foundation, in the eyes of uh, historians uh, from around, Holocaust historians uh, from um, around the world, is a, a source of uh, fascination, source of information, and we, whether we are in Poland or in Israel or in Canada, we spend countless hours uh, um, sucking away at this information that keeps flowing from this source. Um, and uh, this place that I would like to call um, perhaps uh, a home of 56,000 survivors or home of their voices. Uh, it is magical. And I remember that as a chair of my Department of History well, many, many years ago, in 2007, I believe, uh, I made a uh, huge offensive and battle in my library in order to uh, gain access to the resources of uh, Shoah Foundation. And uh, I must report with uh, pride that I was uh, prevailed in this struggle. And ever since uh, my university for the last 16 years, uh, um, as they say in French, bon gré, mal gré, but has always subscribed to the, uh, to the, to the DHA. And uh, I'm also very happy to say that, uh, well, a whole generation of my students, and not only my students, uh, have been raised uh, with these testimonies at the very core, at the very center of their education. Um, in any case, no student of mine can graduate without thorough and deep knowledge of resources of uh, this particular miraculous collection. And, uh, sorry. This class, correct? Okay, um, so in, in any case, I would like to thank for this extraordinary uh, initiative. And very often I receive as, uh, as someone, our university is, one, I believe, one of only two universities in Eastern Canada having a direct access to these resources. Very often I receive phone calls, Jan, could you please, um, do you have access to Spielberg? If you do, please uh, um, uh, check something for me, or check, which I, of course, uh, do. Uh, now, my today's uh, lecture is basically a plaidoyer. It's an appeal um, for 
um, for the importance of primary research into the Holocaust. Why in a moment? Um, first of all, as most of you uh, know, uh, the interest in the study of the Holocaust uh, uh, is a global phenomenon. Um, and. Uh, actually quite recent in historical terms. If you look at the depth of interest in the Holocaust, we are talking about last uh, three decades uh, perhaps, which in historical terms is of course not a very long period of uh, time. What is very surprising is the fact that the more uh, distant we are from the event, um, the more um, passions and the more discussions the event seems to, uh, to generate for reasons which, which we can discuss perhaps later in the, uh, in the uh, discussion uh, period. Holocaust has become, um, uh, surprisingly, or perhaps today unsurprisingly, a universal benchmark of uh, human um, evil. And hence are the energetic uh, attempts undertaken by state and institutional state-sponsored actors to position oneself uh, with regard to that particular event. Now, the study of the Holocaust, as we know, is one of the fastest growing areas of historical uh, research uh, due to the universality of topic of human evil um, and to the growth also of, um, of Holocaust education, unprecedented pedagogical endeavor with global reach and global ramifications. Now, um, however, most of this interest goes, as this I can say as someone who organized many congresses, colloquia, and uh, me learned meetings, most of this, uh, the thrust of this interest nowadays translates into memorial studies, so-called commemoration, memory, uh, literature about the Holocaust. We call it meta-Holocaust studies. Um, uh, uh, impact on the second and impact on third generation. And uh, it is very good that these studies are at the also center of our attention. However, one could say that this uh, kind of interest implies that we know already enough about the event itself. And my uh, role today is to disabuse us of this particular uh, notion that we do not really know enough and the primary research into Holocaust itself is absolutely vital. Um, and uh, it can be combined with post-Holocaust studies, but it cannot uh, replace. So now, um, as most of you know, the founder of uh, Holocaust uh, um, studies, uh, Raoul Hilberg, um, uh, famously um, divided the human scenery of the Holocaust into three, um, let's say, segments, uh, the perpetrators, the victims, and uh, the, uh, the bystanders. Now, in this last category is perhaps the most uh, nebulous one, and uh, arguably I would say that at least in Eastern Europe, uh, this category of bystanders does not uh, really Mm, find uh, cannot be maintained. It has to be redefined. Simply speaking, uh, by standing and on, let's say, attitude which I study, have studied for, for a few decades now, uh, cannot be really understood in the context of the horrifying um, uh, presence of the genocide on the ground. So in Eastern Europe, I prefer um, Elżbieta, Elżbieta Janicka's uh, terminology or term participating observers. It doesn't qualify, let's say, uh, the stand of bystanders, but it uh, makes them more, let's say, engaged in this. Uh, they are much less aloof, uh, much less, uh, let's say, distant from the, uh, from the uh, event. Um, now, uh, I brought here um, the focus of my talk, of course, will be related to my, uh, to my uh, research, which means Poland. Um, I brought, before I launch, let's say, into um, uh, my proper discourse, um, I would like to share with you a few documents uh, which uh, actually um, will show you how much remains to be studied. These are just parts and bits and pieces, um, tips of an iceberg, if you will. Um, here, what you see is a list, actually, on this, uh, uh, on this, um, mm, on the uh, on the screen behind me. It's a letter, basically, part of a letter sent by a Polish. Uh, 
um, village elder and um, commune leader, um, local um, administrator uh, to his uh, German overseers. Uh, and here in this letter and the list, the Polish administrator from Eastern Poland, close to Schedelt, uh, <clears throat> the Polish administrator informed the German officials that the um, council of his commune, so his local authorities, <coughs> had plans regarding the real estate belonging to the Jewish inhabitants still living in the villages of his jurisdiction. Uh, his name was Sukiennik of this official, Polish official, uh, was quite obviously planning ahead, knowing that his Jewish neighbors would soon be deported to larger ghettos, most likely in this case to Siedlce. It's from December 1941. And so the house of, he, he writes here, house of Jankiel Rosenbaum in Hushtev was to be given to Stanisław Zawadzki, a homeless laborer. Maria Tarkowska was to move into the house of uh, Cipa Repkowska from Wysów. The house, yard, and pigsty belonging to Lazor Novenstern from Niemojki would go to Józef Wolski, the teacher and Moshko Schild's house and the yard would be given to Eugeniusz Wyszkowski, the director, Polish director of local mill. The list continues on and on, <coughs> including teachers, artisans, and other so-called deserving Aryans who were scheduled to move into the Jewish houses, which to use the parlance of the times, were soon to become post-Jewish post property. Interestingly, these plans were drawn up even as the Jewish neighbors continued to, leave, to live in their houses. A simple letter makes us face several questions. How much did the local populations know about the impending Holocaust? How open was the German system of terror? Did it allow non-Germans, non-German participating observers, to realize their own goals? Is it collaboration, collusion, or patriotic initiative destined to keep the Jewish property out of German hands? Um, you have, we have as historians, miles and miles of uh, court records, Polish courts from period of uh, war. I am, I can't say I'm happy to report, but I am, I am to report that uh, these courts, which functioned throughout the occupation, were never tapped by historians. Um, we have absolutely mm, huge collections of uh, municipal appellate courts from various side, uh, parts of Poland, which contain an absolute deep wealth of information about the Holocaust, about the fate of the Jews. Mm, I'm not going to translate the document, just I'm throwing them on the screen so you know they exist. It's not my invention. Uh, this is just a part of a, a little criminal case from Siedlce, a small town in eastern Poland from 1940 and uh, 1941, I'm sorry, um, uh, which uh, deals with Jews beating up a Polish uh, field worker. On the strange, surprising story, what happened in reality, when you read through this story, is that there is a train carrying Jewish slave laborers from one area to another. And Jews were, of course, as you know, used as slave uh, labor. Uh, at a certain point, the train stops for some reason among the fields between the stations. And the Jews who are dying of starvation, they charge to the fields to eat carrots. And in the process, they simply trample over a Polish guard who was to prevent them from stealing, uh, the, anyone from stealing the carrots. I mean, these are bits and pieces, but they do uh, add depth to our knowledge. And I mean, we have thousands of these cases. Put together, we are able then to for the last time to hear the voices of Jewish non-survivors. They are being deposited, they are being interrogated, they are being imprisoned. All of this documentation is open, available, and it is practically unused. So I'm happy to report that this uh, um, other kind, doc kind of documents. Um, uh, so Gruner was some kind to mention my interest in Polish police. Uh, Polish police, which was subject to German orders, but in terms of their treatment or mistreatment of the Jews, they ex uh, demonstrated a huge degree of own agency. Uh, a force of 20,000 armed men who, before I wrote a book, did not exist uh, as a phenomenon on our, let's say, um, uh, on our horizon of our knowledge. 
Uh, what you see here is a report um, uh, to, uh, of Polish police from a small location in central Poland, uh, a listing number of bullets expended by Polish officers uh, uh, shooting the Jews during the uh, liquidation of a very small ghetto um, in November 1942. Uh, and the Polish officers simply had to list exactly how many bullets they expended because the Germans were stingy uh, with, with, with supplies of, uh, of, of bullets. Uh, another document that, don't worry, there are not many of these documents left, just a few. Uh, so another document is dated a bit later, January 13, 1943. Uh, this is a report written by um, a sergeant of Polish police uh, to his superiors in Łuków, also central eastern Poland. Uh, and in this report, he, I will translate it for your benefit. He writes, I wish to report that on January 11, 1943, in the evening, the elder of Kozuchówka commune arrested six Jews who wandered about in the village and brought them to our police sta uh, station. The elder of Janik commune brought here three Jews and one Jewess. The elder of Sarnov, Tuhovic commune, brought three other Jews and we, ourselves, policemen, caught more Jews and delivered them to the offices of Tuhovic commune. Finally, there were 23 Jews in custody, including two Jewesses. One of the Jews died in jail, so that there were 22 left. From that number, 11 persons were killed on January 12, 1943. 11 others were left alive because the policemen, due to poor quality of the ammunition, that's because of a large number of duds, decided not to shoot anymore. Once again, document dense in various layers of meanings. How to unpack it? Why would village elders arrest the Jewish refugees wandering in the countryside and deliver them to the Polish police? These were their neighbors most of the time friends from schools most often. In a remote area of eastern Poland, here, 23 Jews have been apprehended in the course of few days by the villagers and by the Polish police. They were executed, although some of them have been spared for a moment due to poor quality of the ammunition. Where are the Germans? How is the German system working? Um, the levels and layers of complicity. Um, another short citation from Moshe Welz. During the Aktion, Aktion is, well, I will tell you more about the Aktion, uh, most horrifying moments of liquidations of the ghettos uh, done with horrifying brutality and horror and terror. Uh, so I quote here a document by Moshe Welz. During the action, Aktion, some Jews have fled, some hid in the bunkers. The Poles knew about it and organized on their own a Jew hunt, first in order to rob them and later to murder them. In Markova, a village close to Weinzut, Poles found 28 Jews. They shot them and they took all they had on them. They even removed the golden teeth of the victims. Antoni Tsidan was the chief of this group of Poles. He took over the Jewish goods and even today he still lives in the same village. In the same village, Markova, more than 200 Jews have been buried in a mass grave. All of them have been earlier shot by the Poles." End quote. Now, today, at the site of this, uh, in this very village, you can visit a museum, which has been opened seven years ago, a museum of Poles saving the Jews, uh, which, uh, uh, which sort of dove, dovetails with what uh, uh, Robert mentioned before. Uh, questions, more questions, and questions of a very general, very universal nature these documents invoke. So for instance, uh, um, well, what are the roots of hate? And when does human life, in this case Jewish life, lose absolutely its value? It happens very quickly. These Jewish lives, in the eyes of very many people, non-Jews, have no more value. Taking Jewish life uh, is of no consequence. So the questions, uh, the, these questions are at the core of what uh, new school, we call it the new school of Polish, Polish school of Holocaust research tackles. There are very many painful issues. 
And uh, what I came here to talk about today is uh, the book that um, uh, Professor Gruder mentioned, uh, Night Without End, a book which I had the honor and privilege to co-write and to co-edit, um, uh, regrouping a number of scholars, young scholars, older scholars from Poland, but also from France and Canada. Um, the Polish version of this book, uh, book was uh, two volume one. This is, uh, this is a, let's say, a shortened version. Um, so uh, things that I will talk about are mostly things that are somehow related to the research, uh, which was at the base of this uh, particular uh, research, uh, research effort. So originally published, uh, the book originally published in uh, in Polish was, as I mentioned, two volumes, 1,600 pages, three and a half thousand footnotes. You don't want to touch it. <laughs> uh, and uh, the book actually um, uh, was published in April of 2018, which was at the height of so-called Polish Holocaust law debate or scandal. And it triggered extraordinarily hostile reaction on the part of the Polish state. I mean, we, the authors, could not have anticipated the fury with which the authorities, the machinery of the state, would go into an overdrive in order to destroy, let's say, the authors and the book itself. I mean, it's something quite actually unprecedented, the, what happened back then, and which ties in with, uh, with the talk of today. So briefly, I will tell you just a few words. An unprecedented campaign of hate, uh, misinformation, and slander, which, which happened when the book was published. I will tell you why in a moment, of course. Um, so you have including the office of president, prime minister, minister of justice, minister of education, minister of education of Poland, who um, referred to this book, I quote, as anti-Polish Nazi rag, end quote. Uh, this is the kind of language which you can encounter now in um, Holocaust distorting jurisdictions, if I, if I may say so. So a long trial that uh, I and my co-editor uh, had to endure, um, a trial, uh, let's say, financed and organized by um, uh, proxies for the Polish government. Uh, we were vindicated, we won, but of course it takes years out of your, uh, of your research time. So uh, in a way, Polish authorities were quite victorious because historians not writing history are no good to us, I guess. Um, so this was not the, the, our vindication and uh, this uh, win in a court of law was not, however, the end of the story. Immediately, uh, the Polish Minister of Justice decried the verdict, I quote, according to the Warsaw Court of Appeals, the authors of the book Night Without End are academics so they can lie with impunity. The verdict is not only an embarrassment for the court, but also a judicial assault on the idea of justice, end quote. Once again, this gives you an idea of the temperature, the um, emotions, the also hate, uh, which Holocaust research uh, seems to, uh, to trigger. Um, so I don't want to go any, any, any further uh, in this uh, debate because I want to go back to history. Just remember that in the background there is this very awful noise, translating sometimes into very unpleasant actions, targeting, especially in Poland, but also in places like Lithuania, uh, Hungary, of course, of course, <laughs> translating into campaign of... Uh, a Holocaust distortion, which has replaced the Holocaust denial as the chief, um, I would say, threat facing our discipline. Now, we were very proud as a community of scholars and educators that we somehow diffused the issue of Holocaust denial. Well, it, is, uh, it was a game when compared to Holocaust distortion. Holocaust distortion, which is being now fueled by boundless, limitless resources of certain states, uh, basically stipulates that we don't deny that Holocaust happened. Simply, our people had nothing to do with it. And this is basic, basic premise of Holocaust distortion, which has become now the absolutely fundamental threat to the future of our endeavors, whether we study history, whether we teach history, whether we educate about history. But now let's look at why this book triggered this, this uh, hateful uh, reaction. So first of all, uh, first of all, this is um, a study 
as, uh, as Professor Gunnar mentioned, of uh, eight, in Polish edition of nine, uh, counties of uh, Poland under the occupation. It's an exercise in microhistory. In other words, what we were looking at is not only an area Microhistory looks at, at, at history of a region, but also people and their trajectories who move through this, uh, through this area and following them sometimes if we can do it. Why the study of the Holocaust is so vitally important for this particular area, which is Poland? If you need to be convinced, I am very eager to do it. So remember that five out of six million uh, victims of the Holocaust have been put to death on pre-war Polish territory. Five, nearly five out of six million. It gives you an idea why these studies are so absolutely vital. Either Jews who are living in these areas or Jews who are brought to these areas to die. Second, three, as it has been already mentioned uh, by Robert, three million or more than half of all victims of the Holocaust uh, were Polish citizens. It is indeed an important qualifying feature. Now, 1%, close to 1% of Polish Jews who found themselves under the German occupation survived the war. In other words, it gives you an idea of the totality of Holocaust in Poland, one of a hundred. 30,000 survivors from Poland out of 3 million people. So it gives you an idea of how extraordinarily uh, efficient was this horrible system which I and my colleagues tried to describe, among other things, in, uh, in this, uh, this book. Finally, a list can be much longer, but um, to uh, end it, all camps of death have been also located on, uh, on uh, Polish uh, territory. So uh, what we are looking here are mostly rural areas. So this book is not about big cities. We know about, bi about big cities, we know more. Not everything we should, but more. Uh, we were looking at the rural areas with small shtetls, but that's where 75% of Polish Jews lived. It was not in big, largest cities like Kraków. Uh, often when, when I say, when someone says ghetto, the image that comes to your mind is high walls, right? With barbed wire and crushed uh, um, glass on top of it. In reality, it is the reality of very few ghettos. Warsaw, Kraków, Łódź, that's it. Otherwise, you have flimsy fences, sometimes no fence at all. Um, the place that I studied in this book, uh, uh, Wengrów, was actually a shtetl which became a ghetto, which means that the whole town has been transformed into a ghetto. Poles were living outside. So there were no walls, there was no border, physical border. Nevertheless, people were dying of hunger as well. So we are looking here at those rural counties, open ghettos, uh, Holocaust was not performed, was not being enacted in social isolation. One more thing that, that comes so, so dramatically across in our research and hopefully in the book too, is that Holocaust in Poland has been as public, in your face, as humanly possible. Now, doing microhistory implies deep um, knowledge of sources. You have to triangulate these sources to come down to the level of individual experience of dying or survival. Uh, and here I have to say that one of the fundamental sources are the testimonies which you here provide us with. Uh, all the 50,000 of them, so they are essential part of our work. But there is more, of course. The Jewish memory has been extraordinary well preserved given the state of destruction one can only marvel at how much we still have the so-called 301 um, the testimonies from 1944 45 46 from the jewish historical institute in warsaw short documents 6000 of them extraordinary hard hitting there is no ulterior motive in these documents simply this is a shout of despair what happened to me? What happened to my family? What happened to my little community? They are gone. And so these are documents that we are looking at. Uh, visual history archive, as I mentioned, and the Yad Vashem resources, the, the interviews and testimonies of Jews collected in Israel in 1960s. If you want a wonderful topic for a psychology department, you can look how survivor memory take the same person, 1945 in Poland, then 1960s in Israel, and then 1996 here, 
uh, the same person, how this person is being trans, it, her memory is being transformed over decades. So this is what we look. Then this German memory, a German memory which uh, which we of course uh, uh, is very specific kind of memory reflected through court records uh, of trials against uh, Nazi perpetrators, uh, which is essential. But also one, one has to know how methodologically to address these problems. And then we have the Polish memory. As I have shown you, the Polish records, uh, lower administration, resistance records, and perhaps the most, uh, the last greatest bulk of Holocaust related information, which is so called August files, which I and my colleagues were studying in depth. What are the August files? They are the proceedings which have been um, court proceedings against people in Poland who, according to the letter of the law, were collaborating with the Germans. One form of this collaboration was um, helping the Germans in achieving their goal of uh, annihilating Jewish population in Poland. And uh, there we have a few thousand uh, of these, uh, of these uh, uh, August uh, court cases, millions of pages, and thousands and thousands of Polish witnesses deposited, interrogated in 1940s, freshly after the 1946, 47, 48, um, perhaps last uh, um, of this magnitude, a source of incredible information. One has to be cautious, methodologically cautious, but this is also a part of, uh, of what we did. Now, what we found out. First of all, let me tell you that uh, we, as we in terms of scholars of Holocaust in Poland, um, tend to divide, uh, tend to divide um, uh, the uh, chronology of the Holocaust into three periods, um, which is specific for Poland. Uh, one, it's the so-called early occupation and ghettoization, um, and this will be the fall of Poland until uh, late 1941. And then there is a period in uh, which we call simply Aktionen. And this is the period of liquidations of the ghettos, all hundreds of them. They are being liquidated by the Germans and their enablers between March 1942 and uh, April of 1943. Vast majority of Jewish, uh, of Jewish, as they call it, residential areas of Jewish communities are being destroyed, uh, are being destroyed uh, in the summer and the fall of 1942. And, uh, our team, we decided to pay extraordinary attention. Uh, in my own work, I tried to go hour after hour, looking at one shtetl that I was really observing from close quarters. I wanted to know what happened between 5 a.m., where the poly uh, German and Polish and Ukrainian police cordoned the, the city off. Then uh, through the initial thrust uh, of theirs into the ghetto, the massacres which occurred between 10 and 11 a.m. And then you can see the destruction of, this Jew of these Jewish communities on during one day of absolute horror. So this is, so all, all in all, in this book we were following 100, the fates of 110,000, <coughs> sorry, I didn't finish. So you have the second period, which is the liquidation uh, actions, which are this underreported phenomenon. Sometimes you say Jews were delivered to Treblinka. No, you did not deliver the Jews to Treblinka. You had to practically murder between 10 and 50 percent of them in situ, in those shtetls. Uh, so the others were dragged uh, by their feet to, to, the, uh, to the cattle cars. Um, so, um, uh, so, if, so the third period is post-liquidation. And this is something that I described in my previous book, which is called Judenjagd. The Germans refer to it as Judenjagd, or the hunt for the Jews, which starts as soon as the ghettos have been liquidated, and it lasts until the very days of war, of war until the liberation. Um, so uh, we're looking at the fates of 110,000 Jews uh, who lived in these uh, counties that we describe in this, uh, in this book. And, uh, Jewish population in these areas was between five and ten percent of the total, which was Polish average for these uh, for these uh, for these areas. And these, as once again, these areas were much more representative than the huge urban centers such as Warsaw or Krakow. Uh, and here uh, we were also looking at uh, levels of local uh, local complicity um, and. Uh, 
um, and we found out that the survival rate uh, of uh, Jews in, in these areas, which we studied, was about 1.5%. Uh, so more or less reflecting the global data. Now, there were local variations. Uh, one county, for instance, discussed uh, um, by my colleague Anna Zapalets was uh, in the east. Uh, it, was, um, it was until 1941 uh, in the Soviet occupation zone. Therefore, the Germans arrived later, and also this area was uh, liberated earlier. So the occupation, German occupation, lasted much shorter time. Therefore, 6% of the Jews survived, OK? Um, because the chief reason is that, uh, that the occupation, <laughs> was, occupation lasted, lasted a, a, bit, a bit less than in Western counties where the uh, Soviet forces uh, moved in in January 1945. And actually, reading this thing, you can, reading this book, you can see how horribly difficult were these last months because the Jews had no more resources, no more strength. These were dying people and each and every week brought new victims. So each and every week of occupation meant death for more and more uh, people. So <clears throat> what we were looking also was the percentage of Jews trying to flee. And a lot has been uh, said about this, but usually the questions, the answers were many, some, few. Well, in this work, we tried to quantify things, to say exactly how many Jews were trying to flee, how. And by and large, we found out that around 10% of, uh, of Jews uh, fled the liquidated ghettos, which leaves us with this huge number of 200, 250,000 Jews who made it outside of the liquidation zone. Own, but very few of them lived uh, until the liberation. As I mentioned, 30,000. So we were looking then what happened to this dark number, this 200 plus thousand Jews who were wandering through the countryside begging for help. And uh, this is where we got to the moment when the Polish authorities could not tolerate this kind of work anymore, because the sad truth is that in Nearly 70% of our cases which were able to pin down, to pinpoint, let's say, down, um, the fate uh, the local non-Jewish population was uh, either directly or indirectly denunciation responsible for the death of these unsurvivors. But Jews who had a working chance, they actually had a working chance to, uh, to survive. Um, we looked at, uh, <coughs> looked at the Jewish survival strategies. We learned a lot. Um, so first of all, Ju uh, Jewish, Jewish attempts to survive was not actually to flee to, let's say, seek Christian help. Initially, it was moving from one liquidated ghetto to another, to another, as long as there still were ghettos. When there were no more ghettos, you were looking for a safe haven in so-called Yulak, which is Jewish labor camp. Everything where Jews could still officially be, remain, uh, remain alive. And then we looked at so-called rest ghettos, which are secondary ghettos created by the Germans for these Jews who were wandering around, offering them some kind of a, uh, of a refuge. We found out also that the most dangerous place of all, the most deadly place of all for the, um, uh, for the, um, for the Jews were small towns. Um, in, uh, in the town which I studied, practically not even one Jew made it through the, through the war. Why? Well, because small towns were exactly the places where Jews were prevalent, were so numerous before the war, but also they became deadly traps because you don't have the anonymity of a large, uh, of a large uh, place, and you have here uh, the proximity of different kind of police authorities. So we found out that, this, that these shtetls became simply deadly traps uh, for the Jews. Now, looking at these aktionen, we found out uh, throughout these uh, studied counties that, uh, as I mentioned, between 10 and sometimes 50 percent of local Jewish population has been murdered uh, in situ, in the streets. Uh, and if you read, in, if you listen, for instance, in Jewish account from Tarnow or from any other place, 
you hear a Jewish survivor stating that the streets were running with Jewish blood. It is not a licentia poetica. It is actually a pretty, pretty graphic description of what has happened. In, in, in places like Tarnów, municipal works actually charge the municipal council for covering the traces of blood uh, with, uh, after the liquidation of the ghetto with sand. There are, there are bills to prove it, right? So, so when, you, when, you, when you try to understand the levels of horror to which Jewish communities have been subjected uh, during these sometimes hours, sometimes days, because the horror could last, depending on the, side of the, on the size of the city, the horror could last, uh, um, last a long, uh, a long time. So in the case of my Vengrov, it was uh, between 10 and 20 percent of total Jewish population murdered in the streets on the day of the Aktion. Uh, something unimaginable. Uh, in Novetark, 20 percent. Zwotrów ghetto, 36 percent. Now in some uh, ghettos studied in, in the by one of the authors in Biugoda area, up to 50% murdered in situ. Why? Because the railway station was far away. In the eastern part of, uh, of this county, there were simply no railway tracks close, so it was easier to kill people in situ than to, uh, than to drag them to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the railways. We looked at the German strategies, uh, uh, at the mobilization of uh, police forces. We don't know enough about it. And when you read these repeated reports, <coughs> Jewish reports and Polish reports from what happened, you must know that there was a template, how to liquidate a ghetto. We actually have found one of them. What to do from, from 6 a.m. To, to, to 7 a.m. and so on. When you have a break for meal, I mean, this is the kind of horrifying efficiency with which, um, uh, which it has been uh, done. And then we described the openness of the German system of horror. In other words, Germans knew how to innovate. They knew how to incorporate other organizations, people uh, into their genocidal project. It's quite horrifying when you see, and from our studies was that basically the less forces the Germans had in one particular area, the more open they were to open up their genocidal initiative to locals who voluntarily very often got involved. You can talk about voluntary firefighters, you can talk about blue police, you can talk about crowds of people who joined in initially to rob and then to look for hidden Jews in bunkers, in various attics, and so on and so forth. So the list of things which we encountered, most of them were surprising to us ourselves. I mean, not that we did not know this story, but we did not know enough of this story. So all these things that I wanted to present here today to you is to show how essential continued Holocaust research is. Now, why this, uh, this research at the edge of Jewish dying community and the so-called mainstream society is so essential. Well, it deals with tens of millions of people. It deals with people who are like you and I thrust into a situation for which they are not ready. Psychologically speaking, we don't know what happens to make so many of these normal regular people willing partners in genocidal affair. And this is something very troubling, actually. So, so some of these, que we are leaving our readers very often with many questions. There are no, uh, no clear answers. Although, for my own usage, I tend to stress the importance of ideology of hate. Uh, if you have a previously pre-existent ground on which hate can grow, then this really facilitates. It makes this transition from, let's say, um, unpleasant relations, very quickly deteriorating to hate, and then to genocidal, uh, genocidal actions, uh, it is something overwhelming. It's overwhelming the speed with which our morality can collapse. So once again, uh, this is a part of this, of this story. Now, so slowly, slowly in, uh, drawing here to an end, uh, all the counties are very different. You would say at the end of the, but at the end of the day, practically all Jews are dead. So this extermination, this genocidal policy can follow one pattern in one area, another pattern in another area, but at the end of the day, practically all Jews are dead. 
Uh, and this is this description of this common denominator, Jewish death, is something that we uh, were preoccupied. So what remains? More research into local context, quite clearly. Something that historians should, should do by all means. If we are able to descend to the level of individual vécu, individual fates, we can shed light on more general processes. Uh, second, role of elites in the Holocaust. In the case of Poland, church on basic level, of level of parishes. Uh, why is it that when you listen to the testimonies here of, uh, of Jewish survivors, why is it that they fear when they are in hiding, the most deadly day for them is Sunday? Uh, because their, their hosts will come from the mass uh, very often very furious at the Jews uh, because they uh, crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so concluding, uh, do we know enough about the history of the Shoah? Hardly. Vast archival oral and other uh, sources are a constant reminder about the extent of our ignorance. Behind all this lies a reality that few historians have recognized and dealt with. The Holocaust was indeed ein Meister aus Deutschland, master from Germany, uh, however, it became a European-wide project and without the participation of certain segments of populations in countries occupied by Nazi Germany or allied with it, the final solution uh, could not have been carried out, or at least not the way it was. Omar Bartov once noted, I quote, Eastern Europe is not merely the site of the Holocaust in the physical sense that most of Europe's Jews lived there and were murdered there. It was and remains the heart of the Holocaust in that it was where Jewish and Christian civilizations formed a long, though troubled, tradition of living side by side and where that social and cultural fabric was ultimately shattered in World War II and the Holocaust. The history of the Holocaust, to quote Yehuda Bauer, I quote, it's a part of the present, it's not dead, it's not even past. Thank you. Professor Thank Grabowski. You. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to open the floor for a Q&A. And for those of you in the room, um, please raise your hands. And we will bring you a small microphone that looks like this so that you're audible on Zoom. And for those of you on Zoom, please ask your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the window. Maybe we could start with Professor Allenson. Um, yeah, more. My colleague Yamor is going to help bring the microphone, and my colleague Maya is going to help moderate the Q&A on Zoom. You're right here in the second row. Thanks very much. Um, I have a good friend, Thane Rosenbaum. It's a name worth uh, you investigating. His parents were Holocaust survivors, and he's a brilliant lawyer, journalist, and uh, moralist, philosopher. And the book he wrote while he was a professor of law was the myth of moral justice. So what you've described so clearly and so well is a justice system that was immoral. So Germany obviously had laws and the Nazis followed the laws. So there really needs to be a aggressive communication that having laws that are not moral just allow horrible behavior because people are following the law and there's no consequence. So this is something that um, I personally feel very strongly about. And even on our uh, judicial system, uh, has had so much, so many problems and corruption. You know, you're not familiar with this, but there's a lawyer named Tom Girardi, who's well known to people that read the LA Times. And basically, he manipulated the legal system by, use, by using money to bribe <coughs> the bar association, the judges, not all, obviously, but a large number. So, unless, you know, the, the good people stand up, yeah. spend the time, understand that a justice system without morality is not only ineffective, but it's evil. 
You are enti entirely right. And the thing is that uh, that I, about uh, 15 years ago, I was, as I mentioned, I was working a long time in the archive, judicial archives of German courts also in Poland. And uh, I became aware of this legal dimension of the Holocaust uh, all to painfully. Uh, imagine that uh, people with uh, low degrees, uh, skilled lawyers who continued their brilliant careers after the war, I tracked down most of them, who were in Warsaw at this time uh, in uh, Sondergericht, Deutsches Gericht and so on. Uh, these people were actually responding to a central command to, incre to make the law as uh, dramatically predatory, to make the law as uh, uh, anti-Jewish uh, uh, as possible, and they did it. And they responded in creating this monstrous kind of law, which, for instance, uh, just to give you a uh, tiny example, one case was of a, of a Jewish boy who fled a column of, uh, of slave laborers going to work outside of the Warsaw Ghetto. The question is, should he be executed? Uh, because he did not flee the ghetto, he fled a marching column outside of the ghetto. Okay. Um, and this is the kind of language that the, these lawyers started to discuss. Final, the final solution for this question was one of the lawyers said, yes, uh, he has to be executed because a Jew carries the ghetto within himself. Uh, in legal terms, it was better explained than I can do it right now. So, you, so I do agree with you entirely. This is uh, perversion of the law is a uh, horror. Please, uh, Rolf. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jan, uh, for this. Thank you, Jan, for this uh, uh, really uh, fascinating talk. I was struck by the first document, obviously, as a historian. So uh, there was this one where you showed this list of the, where uh, 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 some local authority envisioned what to do with Jewish property. Um, uh, some decade ago in Germany, there were attempts to kind of verifying what did people know right, about right. Like mass murder. Uh, and there, there were some glimpses what people discussed in barbershops, for example, in bakeries about the Holocaust in, back in Berlin, right, in 1942, 1943. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, are there a, a kind of similar research attempts to figure out what did actually the local authority know, knew to make this kind of list. What did he anticipate uh, there? What was the knowledge of the people? And the I mean, and stuff and so forth. Yes, I mean, in Poland, it's assumed that everyone knew everything. Um, uh, basically, the proximity to horrors, uh, the place that I did, the document actually has been generated uh, 35 miles away from uh, Treblinka. And the Treblinka 1, a deadly labor camp, was uh, next door. Uh, the whole area was uh, uh, was sprinkled with uh, with a deadly uh, so-called Judenlager, um, um, where people were dying like flies. So even before the official beginning of the Holocaust, everyone knew the writing was on the wall. and. Uh, that, that Jewish life was worth nothing. So these people, of, of course, had not always, they were convinced that all Jews would die, but they were in, a, they were in December 1941, they were pretty, pretty certain where the things were going. That's quite, quite obvious. So the issue of what people knew is uh, less relevant for, these, uh, for the Eastern territories because everyone was, was, was informed from day to day, so to say. Please. Robert. I have the microphone. I'll, I'll ask actually two questions. You can choose which one to answer. One piggybacks off of what Wolf just asked. In a certain sense, a lot of the debate around the Just Act was about this issue of agency in Poland during the period of the German occupation. Right. If Poland did not exist as a country because it was wholly occupied, Poland did not need to restitute property taken right. from Jews. But these documents by the Blue Police and by other local authorities indicate a degree of agency, even if there was not national agency. So as the political historian in the room, you know, this issue becomes quite mm -hmm. interesting, quite troubling for the, the post-war right. that, that, that Poland needs to engage in. The other question, which might be easier. I agree with you completely that, that much more research needs to be done, but there are some of us who feel that, well, yeah, I was trained as a German historian, you were trained as a Polish historian. Study of the Holocaust it is often focused almost exclusively on the German narrative, to a certain extent the Polish narrative, and to a certain extent the French narrative. What can we do, I'm trying to learn right. serbo Croatian to get around this, <clears throat> what can we do to shine some light on the other black holes in our, in our knowledge? 
Russia? Well, my, I will start with the, with the second question, actually, is uh, something that I have been fighting hard for a long time, which is uh, which is this integrated history of the Holocaust, integrated into national history. Uh, in other words, in, in other words, uh, for me, what is absolutely devastating is this separation, this exclusion of uh, Holocaust, history of the Holocaust from national histories. Um, <clears throat> to give you an example, a Polish Historical Association, the oldest association of Polish historians with over a century 130 years of in existence. Um, they are meeting every five years. Uh, they have a National Congress of Polish Historians. I went the last 30 years of their congresses with fine comb and uh, imagine how many, I'm not talking sessions, how many papers uh, dealing with the Holocaust have been read since the year 2000 at the, uh, at the meetings of uh, Association of Polish Historians. Your guess is as good as mine. Zero. <laughs> Book is nix. Um, now, the thing is that uh, it, it is. After the start of the IPM, which makes it even more ironic. Right, uh, right, uh, and then and then you have uh, and then you have a situation when one of the uh, best known Polish historians publishes in Germany a book called Geschichte Polens last year, uh, Geschichte Polens, uh, uh, 1939-2015, and in this book, this very illustrious historian spends seven out of 750 pages, seven pages dealing with, I would say, arguably the greatest catastrophe in the history of Poland. Um, so you know this is this level of rejection uh, is uh, something that I would like to hope I would be able, but of course I'm not. But this, if I may uh, say, launch an appeal. This is the integration, absolute necessity of integrating the Holocaust into national histories. Otherwise, we can just as well pack our toys and go home. Um, uh, so that's why well, that's why the the Shoah Foundations. Uh, you know, a mission is so vital also to make these uh, available, these testimonies, right? And the, the other question I will, for the time being, I'll... Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna um, have our eager student ask the question, then a question well, from Zoom, well, and then I will come. Thanks. First of all, it's, it's, yeah, you it's just, red, you just red, just red, just right? Yeah, it was it put on mute for a second there. My name is Shane, hello. It's an honor to meet you. You seem to know a lot of things about the freaking Holocaust. Okay, um, I have a lot of questions, but I want to just kind of speed through them. Or can you just ask one for now, and then we'll uh, put them to the floor and others. What exactly do you think morality is? Well, I guess this is the question. This is this is a question that probably I don't have the time here to respond to. But uh, sorting uh, paraphrase it. Uh, so, no, no, sorting right, right from wrong will have to do. Will have will have to do. Right. Um, yes, please. And so I have a question from Zoom um, from uh, uh, Robert Lebowitz. Um, I am a social worker who works with Polish-born Holocaust survivors, and I help them obtain reparations. Can you offer some sources where you found the personal accounts you referred to, other than the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad uh, Vashem, or the Shoah Foundation? For example, you mentioned uh, Polish court files and Polish police records. Are there others, and um, can we access them? If so, how? Thank you. Uh, well, you know, this is uh, this is a question of uh, very many pages to answer. Uh, the uh, the most uh, the most often used uh, sources uh, were, uh, the gentleman mentioned here. But um, for instance, now I am working with uh, uh, with uh, extraordinary rich files of uh, Polish communes. They are called gminy, akta gminy, um, uh, of uh, this basic lowest form of administration. Where there is a, uh, this is where from this list of uh, of property to be seized from Jews comes from. So, so, so there are very many sources, and I would say that from my point of view, the most promising probably are uh, the records of wartime Polish courts, which have practically been absolutely ignored. Uh, whereas my article perhaps is the only one about this uh, phenomenon of Polish courts and the Jews during the war. Uh, so I would say uh, this is a, a resource which. Uh, which can be easily tapped and available. There is a question. I, I have oh, a. Yes, sir, sorry. I, uh, we know that in, in Germany, um, the children started questioning parents and the grandchildren, and there was a, a reckoning. Has none of that occurred in Poland at all? Are not are not the the 
the yeah. progeny questioning this period? Well, you know, it's, it, a question like this would already trigger a fury in Poland. How dare you compare uh, German uh, gr gr grant uh, Großvater? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, however, do. I have to be very cautious how I answer questions because when I'm in Warsaw, I have several trials. You've been under uh, to, attack, to, yes. uh, I'm in courts uh, quite often. Uh, no, but here the thing is that uh, Polish society has been, by and large, raised in a tradition of own historical innocence, a glorious past uh, and, and the morality of past uh, generations. Um, and now in this situation to admit that this uh, ethos of national innocence is, ba is based in part on a lie is something psychologically speaking very difficult. And, uh, and uh, so um, to give you to answer your question shortly, look, uh, you, one can look at uh, what happens in Polish parliament. Uh, votes on so-called the dignity file, defense of the good name of the nation. Uh, until the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the only area where Polish Democrats spoke with one voice with the autocrats in power, power uh, was the defense of the good name of the nation, regardless of uh, whether it was justified or not. So I am not very optimistic. There is a question. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, you two, I don't know. Okay, two things. One, you said by, bystander is a participant, and that really struck me. I don't know why I've never really thought about that before, but I, I don't, I, I don't know how that. Like, I'd, I'd love to hear just a touch more about that. Okay. I think that's a very interesting concept and could impact a lot of people. The other thing that I just want to say is sort of an observation that was painful today was no matter how much you look at the Holocaust, when you were talking today, the randomness of those like actions, like independent actions where someone died or if the bullets were bad, then they didn't die. God, that was just today in your research that really <clears throat> very hard to take. So I just wanted to- I'll tell you to read, oh, thank you. I mean, the reading, reading about these things uh, um, does not help. I mean, this is a, this is, this is, you know, uh, it takes uh, every each scholar involved in study of Holocaust will tell you the same thing. I mean, at, at the bottom, when you come to this randomness, also, you know, you, you can you can plan your life all the way you want from here to from here to eternity, and uh, there is fate that will settle in any case uh, what happens off you, especially in these extraordinary circumstances. Now, about the bystanders and those uh, um, and those. Uh, uh, participating observers, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Janicka um, defined them, I, I think that now we are past the bystander time, and that uh, that we need that we need. I am not uh, wedded. I am not, let's say, wedded to one particular definition or term. Uh, I am looking myself for something that I can find useful. I know one thing that bystanding, uh, in its uh, meaning in English language, implies uh, distance. Uh, it implies certain impartiality. Uh, can you? How can you be distanced from the from, from the from your neighbors dying in front of your window, right? Uh, whether you do nothing is already doing something. Um, uh, so here I am open to different suggestions. But nowadays, for instance, when you talk uh, about bystanders in uh, in French, it's the témoins, witnesses, uh, even removing them even further. Uh, so um, I think in Germany it will be Zuschauer. Um, uh, so it it implies this. It gives us all Europeans this degree of innocence or blind uh, sort of innocence, which should not be extended to anyone. I would say. Interesting. Um, hi, um, and I have another question from the um, from the Zoom. This is from Kurtz. Um, do you know if the Polish Holocaust law has mainly been applied to well-known Holocaust historians like yourself? Or has it also been used to intimidate, silence, or penalize everyday people like artists, writers, researchers, graduate students, and et cetera, inside and outside Poland who work on the Holocaust? Right. So the question is about Polish Holocaust law. I don't think that Polish Holocaust law was uh, really ever used uh, uh, in a normal way because it was not, not intended to. It was intended to hang, as Damoclean swore, sword over the necks of all of us, and it did its job. Um, so you don't need actually to, uh, to exercise a law in order to force people into silence. Uh, I believe American lawyers have a special expression which is chilling factor. And this is what this, uh, what this law did. And uh, if you look at uh, 
at the debates or lack of debates uh, in Polish academia, um, then uh, then you can see that this law over uh, it was. To my, to my knowledge, it was not even applied, but uh, it, parts of it were. Um, but it exists on the books, and it has this freezing effect on people, which is more self-censorship, is more damaging than censorship, of course. Thank you. Almost oh, and then um, I have one more question um, from uh, da, 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 uh, Barbara Fishkin, who asks, um, I know this is more connected to the Nazi euthanasia of the disabled and not the elimination of most Polish Jews. Um, just wondering if you came across this in any of your research. Uh, thank you for this lecture. Uh, it was sad, terrifying, and important to know. Uh, so the question was about euthanasia? Well, you can say that, uh, that this uh, Holocaust was, in a way, extension of. Uh, so we, when you look at, uh, at T4, prepare personnel, or people who were uh, honing their killing skills on handicapped people in Germany, uh, such as Christian Wirth and the others, they moved straight to Treblinka and Bozhets. They were, the, they were uh, the experts in putting people to death, and they extended their expertise uh, to, the, to the final solution, as they said. So yes. Yeah. Um, I have more questions. We'll just ask a couple more. <laughs> We're Zoom. <Okay>. Yes. <laughs> this is um, uh, from Rabbi Yona um, Buchstein. Do you know if local Polish authorities or individuals assisted with the liquidation of the um, Kielce ghetto? Um, and if the statistics that 10 to 15 percent died in situ, are there ways to, to determine where the mass graves are in Kielce? or other towns? I don't, uh, could I, perhaps can I see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I didn't get it in other than Right here. Um, Kielce? Kielce. Oh, Kielce, okay. Kielce. Um, I don't know exactly exact data for Kielce, uh, which was a large ghetto, of course. Uh, now the thing is that uh, so it was actually on the on the railway track, so probably the numbers are in the area of 10 percent. But I don't know. We have not. No one of uh, my colleagues studied Kielce in much detail. <clears throat> but about the the graves, uh, the problem with the graves is that. Uh, uh, the German authorities, uh, late 1943, beginning of 1942, uh, 44, um, uh, instituted or started something called uh, um, uh, Sonderaktion 1005. And um, so special action of 2005, which was the removal of, um, of, tra of traces of, uh, of genocide. And uh, they basically had working columns of Jews for the most time who were still uh, alive, left alive. Uh, they dug up these uh, huge uh, mass graves and they burned uh, the bodies. Um, but of course, you can't uh, burn all uh, traces. But, uh, but most of these greatest uh, sites uh, of mass murder have been effectively destroyed um, uh, and ashes were, were thrown to the wind. So, uh, but for Kielce, I would have to check because I was not personally involved in the study of that particular location. Um, and uh, this question is from uh, Katarzyna um, Krivowska. Um, I would like to ask about the theme of Jewish gangs, that is, Jew um, Jews who hid, for example, in forests, dugouts, groups, and had to get food to survive. According to interviews, there was supposed to be such a Jewish band in the area uh, area of the uh, apologies uh, K R E P I E C K I forest Kripiki Kripiki forest. So um, there was a, the residents there organized a civic guard. Groups of residents on the sticks that patrol the streets. Can you elaborate on the topic of civic guards organized in villages or small cities to fight with um, Jews in hiding? I believe such form of participation in Holocaust took place rather often. Thank mm -hmm. you. Right. Well, thank you for the for. I, I don't know the particular area, despite, despite the, the fact that I do micro history. I don't do every and single single <laughs> micro <laughs> micro history. Um, uh, but uh, the phenomenon of night guards was very um, widespread. Basically, by the end of 1941, uh, the German authorities decided that why should they run around the forest and look for Jews or for uh, escaped Soviet POWs if uh, the local peasants can do it in their stead? Uh, so. Each and every village uh, received. Uh, this was a system which worked very well, actually, against the unarmed, uh, unarmed Jews. But it worked the best. Uh, so they, uh, the Germans gave out one to two rifles per village. Uh, sometimes a 
a pistol with some ammunition, and Axis forces and 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 and, and, uh, and so on were uh, already available. And, and in each and every village, especially in the southeastern Poland and southern Poland, uh, there was a night guard, which was absolutely deadly from the from the point of view of partisans. Uh, the intent of the Germans was also to do uh, so-called. Uh, and uh, um, action against the partisans. But of course, the, the peasants were no match here. Uh, so at the end of the day, it was mostly uh, efficient against uh, the Jews. And of course, uh, the Jews who were hiding in the forest were stealing from the fields uh, produce. They were stealing, of course, vegetables because they were dying of hunger. Uh, therefore, there was an element of, uh, and since Jewish life, as I mentioned, by late 1942 was worth absolutely nothing, then getting rid of uh, these uh, people was, in the eyes of the many, a logical solution to their food problems as well. Uh, so this is also an untold story. I mean, I wrote an article about this. Andrzej Bikowski wrote an article about night guards, but it's still very much an open open question. Just to give you an example that how the system worked well is that each and every village in southeastern Poland had to head so-called zakładnicy. Zakładnicy are hostages. They were not hostages, but they were people who were appointed by the village elder uh, to be responsible for the situation, Jewish situation in the village. So if a Jew was detected, that was on the heads of these hostages. So they were the locals, so they were they had a vested interest in informing the authorities because otherwise they were held to account. So it was a deadly system devised by the Germans but infused with own initiative in various areas by local actors, if that is. Thank you. Are there any other questions from our in-person? Uh, quick little question. Um, oh. you're, you're, thank you. Thanks very much. You're obviously a brilliant historian. How? What, what do you think triggered most powerfully the Germans to admit their culpability? Other than you know, obviously there were trials, because there was a great professor here, uh, Professor Schnauber, who was a German, and he admitted everything and put together a dialogue between the perpetrators and their children and second generation, which I am. <clears throat> um, and this, this incredible German man was alienated by his entire family. They never spoke to him again. And he had the courage to do what was right, make great sacrifices, and he had a tremendous impact. When I went to the dialogue, the, the sound of German being spoken created anger in me. Mm -hmm. And by the time Professor Schnauber uh, had, I'd say, 10 or 12 meetings every other week, there was such a clear sense that the children of the perpetrators despised their parents and were as traumatized as we were. And, and that connection of emotions mm -hmm. was so powerful that I first had some empathy. And once you have empathy, you can't hate it. Our minds work in a way that you, you can only have one emotion at a time. And it's so powerful. So, for, you know, that type of interaction, I think, would work for each group that hates each other. And True. the world is full of True. groups that hate each other. This was so effective. But I'm not aware of any of the uh, Polish leaders stepping up, taking responsibility, and really being a leader. A leader is the man or the woman who stands up and said, I did this, it was wrong. We all have to do what we can to remedy it. That's a leader. So of course. They really don't have a... No. Uh, man, you are entirely right. I mean, you are entirely right. If you look at, for instance, at uh, France, uh, my, my, many of my academic colleagues in France, they watch with envy my own situation because they say what you do is somehow relevant. And wh when we speak out in France, nobody cares because they, everyone already sort of worked this thing over to an extent. 
Um, I, to which I respond that I would prefer a larger degree of anonymity myself uh, rather than all these emotions which are running high. But when you mentioned that the Germans, you know, moved uh, uh, in this direction, it is a phenomenon indeed. Um, and uh, I remember when I was three years ago, a fellow in Munich, and suddenly I wrote this uh, um, absolutely strange letter published in two languages, in German press and press, Anglophone press, press in Germany, uh, penned by a um, uh, foreign minister of Germany, Mr. Heiko Maas, then, and by uh, Professor Wirsching, the chief of Institut Zeitgeschichte in Munich. And the letter was a long letter about full culpability for the Holocaust by the Germans. And they, they ended that if anyone says that the Germans do not carry 100% responsibility for this, then this person is an enemy of United Europe and whatnot. Uh, to which I responded that, hey, hold your horses. I mean, leave us a percentage or two or to, uh, to us, you know, to us Poles, to us uh, Dutch people, to us Frenchmen, right? Because we have a right to de debate our own history too. And if you give our nationalist a carte blanche, it is not a help at all. Uh, so this letter was not published in Germany, it was finally published in, in Israel. <laughs> uh, all right. There are many um, comments in the Zoom chat uh, Q&A thanking you for the, the diligence well, I and think... the carefulness and courage of your research. And I think uh, the in-person audience members would agree. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, just uh, want to make a short, uh, you have seen um, how kind of, I think, good research is the one who actually raises new questions and shows kind of all the gaps we still have. And I think I'm pretty uh, hopeful in a way that this opens a lot of lanes for future doctoral students. I mean, there's tons of stuff what we still need to uh, kind of uh, grapple with. So I think this was a, 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 the best lecture in this sense. Uh, so I thank uh, Jan for this. Thank you, Rob, uh, for I think that uh, is a wonderful occasion for cooperation between our two institutions. And then obviously, uh, uh, the, uh, Mickey Shapiro and Lisa and the family for uh, making this uh, possible. And uh, I also want to thank everybody here in the room for uh, uh, participating and everybody on Zoom. And uh, we invite you all for future occasions. Thank you very much.